Hello, uh, everyone. I think uh, we should start now. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Marat Ahmedjanov. I'm, I'm the publisher from Hertfordshire Press. Uh, we're going to talk uh, today about our new book, which is um, The Silk Road um, Revisited uh, by Nick Rowan. Uh, the Nick Rowan Silk Road Revisited book is our second book. Uh, published by uh, Hertfordshire Press. We had the first book published in 2012 and launched an Open Central Asia book forum uh, in Bishkek. And uh, eight years later, we're launching uh, the second book. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the Hertfordshire Press. The Hertfordshire Press is established in 2005 and it's a small publishing house based in uh, UK. Uh, which specialize in books from Central Asia and about um, Central Asia. The Friendly Steps book by Nikovan was one of our first um, travelogues. Um, for now, we published over 165 books and 20 of them are related to travel in Central Asia. This year, we're lucky enough to have two books on uh, travel. One is Nikovan, The Silk Road Re Revisited, and the second one is by Christopher Jones, uh, meet the stunts, which we're going to launch a bit later in December. Uh, and before I'm uh, going to show you a few videos, I would like to uh, say a few words um, uh, about uh, our author, Nick Robin, whom I met uh, 14 years ago on his first journey uh, to Uzbekistan, uh, where I used to run a, a small publishing co uh, uh, company, the Discovery Central Asia. And uh, we became good friends. Uh, we started to publish Open Central Asia magazine back in 2009. And um, I'm enjoying working with him. And he has a great inspiration for Silk Road and Central Asia. Uh, and today, it's his day uh, with Silk Road revisited. Re Nick, should I pass the uh, microphone to you? Yes, thank you, uh, Marat. I think uh, uh, just to welcome everyone, good evening or good morning, uh, uh, depending where you are in the world. I think just before you get to listen to me talking, um, could we just play the, uh, the there's a, a five minute video which just introduces uh, the book. Silk Road Revisited is a book that I've been writing for some 15 years now, ever since I made my own journey along the Silk Road. And when I met the people and indulged in their uh, traditions and cultures, it struck me that the stories and the histories behind that uh, set of traditions and cultures was really as fascinating and something that's quite often glossed over, certainly in the history books that, uh, that I was taught at school. And I'm not a historian per se, I'm not actually a writer by trade, I am what I call an accidental uh, historian, but I really wanted the stories of this great region, accompanied by stunning and exquisite photography, to be told uh, very much as I had seen the region. And we purposefully chart the course from west to east, from Venice and Italy out towards China. And that's very deliberate. It's, it's starting with the stories of the likes of Marco Polo and his travels, and then unraveling the other characters, the likes of Tamerlane and Kublai Khan or Genghis Khan as you go further towards the east. Silk Road Revisited invites us to take an astonishing cultural and historical journey throughout Europe, Central Asia and China. And it's very much for anyone who wants to find out more about the region, who's a, an adventurer at heart, who maybe wants a historical flavour, but also wants to see through the stunning photography just what the region and what that history has left behind today. Chapter one focuses on the role that Venice as a naval state played at one end of the Silk Road. Not the only terminus, given the Silk Road was a bustling network of trading capillaries spreading throughout Eurasia, 
but perhaps one of the most important, and home to Marco Polo for many years, of course. In the second chapter, we explore Turkey, the gateway to Asia. It was also the playground of the Greeks, and then the center of early Christianity. But while it is the rise of Islam and the Crusades that grab most of the historical attention, one mustn't forget that the Seljuk Empire stretched from the Hindu Kush mountains along the modern Afghanistan-Pakistan border, all the way to the Mediterranean, controlling the western half of the Silk Road. The third chapter covers the land of empires, Persia. Perhaps nowhere in the world has there arisen such a succession of great empires that dominated such a large expanse of territory. The strategic location between the Caspian Sea in the north and the Persian Gulf in the south made Persia one of the most significant regions in the history of the Silk Road. Put simply, any traded goods transported between Central Asia and Western Asia on the main routes of the Silk Roads had to pass through Persia. The enlightened rules of Emperors Cyrus and Darius reflected the teachings of Zoroastrianism, a religion from which many others emanated, and they travelled along the Silk Road. The fourth and fifth chapters cover the heart of the Silk Road, Central Asia, the much less well-known Sogdian and Kushan empires, the rise and spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road as a result, and then the rise of Tamerlane and the importance of the stunning cities of Bukhara and Samarkand. It looks at why this region was such a successful middleman between China and Europe, and how the Mongol invasion gave a new lease of life to the region in the 13th century. And finally, to the last chapter on the land of silk itself, China, we understand the move over from nomads to settled farmers, and learn about Zhang Chang's famous travels to the west during Han Dynasty rule in the second century BC. This was the start of the opening up of the Silk Road to the west, operated by military outposts to enable the free flow of merchants and their goods, but also, crucially, their ideas and technologies. Launching such a book in the middle of a pandemic when we can't easily travel and many of our freedoms uh, have been curbed may seem odd to some, but equally now is the time for reflection and for reading. And this is perfect time in my view for allowing such a book to come out to the market. It's a book that I hope many will find inspiration and, and maybe like to take their own Silk Road journey themselves. And ever since I traveled in the region, I've been really, really impressed by the people that I met. And it was really the people who made my journey and, and made the first book that I wrote uh, so engaging and interesting. Uh, and what you forget quite often is how the cultures and traditions have arrived there, what the history is behind them. And, and you hear the stories of the Silk Road, some are facts, some are fiction. Uh, you hear the great names of the Silk Road, great conquerors, great empires. And that's really why uh, I fell in love with the region, because it is overlooked. It is a slightly uh, unusual place to go and visit, and therefore a place people simply don't know about. And I hope that this book will therefore give people a little bit of a chance to get some of that inspiration themselves. And maybe, just maybe, one or two of them will take the adventure to travel there when we can again. Thanks very much, uh, Angelina. So uh, good evening from uh, London, uh, locked, uh, locked down and locked in London. And uh, thanks very much for joining uh, this evening. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, uh, welcome so many of you today. Uh, I'm sorry that it can't be at the Royal Geographical Society uh, like we did for uh, my first book, uh, Friendly Steps. Uh, but hopefully the fact that it's virtual will allow a few more people to, uh, to join. And for those of you that it's the evening, hopefully with a, a glass of wine. Um, I do have to start this evening with a, a warning. Uh, you've just seen a, a very promising video full of color and splendor and atmosphere. Uh, and from here on in, I only have one more slide to show you, uh, and that's a map. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's, it's just me. Um, and I, I find that there are two schools of thought about sessions when you meet the, uh, the author, as it were. Um, one is the uh, 28th US President uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who basically uh, said he would never read a book if it were possible to spend just half an hour talking to the man who wrote it. 
the other school of thought is in the rather terser words of Canadian uh, novelist Margaret Atwood, who said, wanting to meet an author because you like his work is like wanting to meet the duck because you like his pate. Anyway, whichever school of thought you uh, subscribe to, I hope uh, the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so will uh, at least be a little bit of illuminating about the books I've written uh, and the travels that I've made. Uh, and if not, we're on Zoom, so at least you can mute me uh, whenever you like. Fortunately, today we're talking about the uh, most influential and greatest trading route uh, that has ever been. And as you heard in that uh, short video, I'm, I'm not actually a travel writer or historian, uh, and yet I've been fortunate enough to travel uh, in uh, the regions of the Silk Roads uh, and to write uh, books about both. Um, and, so, you know, the inspiration came very much from uh, my own travels uh, over many years now uh, to uh, parts of Eastern Europe, Middle East, Central Asia and China, uh, each time retracing the route of the old uh, Silk Road. And for me, it became a fascinating obsession to try and piece together all the characters, all the places, uh, all the events, uh, and to really try and look at what the Silk Road has left behind for our, our civilization. Uh, you often hear of many historical names, events, places, uh, and people uh, in literature and media, and I wanted to put together all of that into a book uh, that could just reflect uh, my passion, but also the, uh, the, the great uh, things that the Silk Road has given to, uh, to us today that, that, quite frankly, many of us take for granted. Um, I, I guess if, if we maybe just share the this, this slide of the, uh, the map of the Silk Road, just so that people can get a sense of, of where we're talking, um, I should say at this point that the Silk Road uh, was actually not one uh, single route. Um, it's actually uh, a bit of a misnomer from one of the cartographers, uh, Baron von Richthofen. Uh, it was actually more a series of uh, trading routes of major arteries and capillaries that collided and divided across the breadth of Eurasia. And uh, whereas my own journey that I'll describe a little bit of tonight sometimes varies from the main thoroughfare, then this is actually what always the Silk Road was doing over its history. It was always moving and changing as war or pestilence or high taxes or other economic reasons diverted uh, trade. Um, and another misunderstanding is that very few people actually ever traveled the entire length of the Silk Road and to do so would have been uh, quite long and expensive for any single merchant traveling many centuries ago. If you look at Marco Polo, he took 17 years in the 13th century to, uh, to travel all the way to China. Uh, the Chinese ambassador Zhang Chang uh, in 140 BC uh, took 12 years to travel into Central Asia. Uh, today, fortunately, it's rather quicker uh, and more comfortable. Uh, my own journey took about six months to, uh, to travel 7,000 miles. Uh, involving uh, local transport, uh, things like uh, animals like horses, um, the odd hot air balloon, uh, and I'm sorry for the romantics amongst you, not once did I actually travel by camel. But hopefully you can see just a little bit of, of the Silk Road there on the map and, and the yellow bits are just some of my journeys that I've made uh, uh, over the years. Um, and so goods shuttled back and forth between traders, between different towns and between different countries. And this interaction left a never-ending flow of luxurious and ordinary goods. So from the East, you had paper, for example, ceramic, horses, a uh, number of flowers, including things like chrysanthemums, mulberries, apricots, and of course, silk. And from the West, from Europe, if you like, you had glass from Venice, you had tin, wood, silver, uh, occasionally the odd slave, from, uh, particularly from Russia, very, uh, very much uh, the, prized slaves. And then from the south, spices and gems from uh, India, vines and olives and figs from Persia. Uh, quite literally everything traveled across the Silk Road at one stage uh, or another. And you can envisage camel caravans through the desert, sometimes reported to be over a thousand strong. Uh, quite a sight uh, in, in those days. And as goods traveled, they became a little bit further from their source and acquired a sort of mystique. And so while no Roman ever set foot in China nor a Chinaman in Rome, uh, both enjoyed goods from each other's parts of the world. And so much was the mystique that uh, you know, was attached to these goods. The Romans thought, for example, that silk grew on trees and just couldn't understand how it was made. But they had an insatiable appetite 
uh, that drove uh, trade and, and perhaps is part of why the Silk Road got its name. Of course, the interactions of so many people and their entourages led to a, a huge exchange of ideas, both religious and technological. And so you had this invisible new stream of thinking, spreading technologies like printing or papermaking, uh, the compass and to name a few. And when we in Europe went through our own dark ages, it was the Silk Road that kept a lot of the technologies that the Romans had developed uh, alive. The Silk Road also, of course, allowed religions to spread. Zoroastrianism, Christianity, Judaism and Islam all spread uh, and interacted and integrated thanks to the Silk Road. And although the Silk Road doesn't have a precise origin, because each country, each part of the world was starting these trading uh, routes, by the second century BC, it had become probably, uh, or it had begun the first of its many peaks and, and the East and the West were fully connected. You had globalization, if you like, before globalization. So the Chinese Han Dynasty in the East echoed the Roman Empire in the West, or the Tang Dynasty of the seventh and eighth centuries in China opened up a trade, a new found trade with the West that had never been seen before. And then in the Mongol era, you had this strange period called the Mongol peace in the 13th and 14th centuries, which itself sounds uh, self-contradictory, uh, but was in fact a unified uh, Mongol uh, power that allowed merchants unparalleled safety to trade and travel across the Silk Road. And the Chinese discovered silk, and, and it's a remarkable fabric actually when you look at it, and, and of course it ultimately lends its name to the Silk Road. And that's why perhaps sometimes the Silk Road is viewed very much as a Chinese uh, invention, a Chinese uh, concept. Um, but as I said, it really started from both sides and, and met in the middle. And you might imagine silk to be quite fragile, but the tensile strength of silk is absolutely remarkable. If you lay a gable of silk next door to a gable of steel, it's the silk that is the stronger one. And yet if you look at that silk cocoon spun by the humble silkworm, uh, feeding on simple mulberry leaves uh, in parts of Central Asia, Persia and China, and you unravel the very delicate thread, it will stretch out for over a mile and a half. It, it is the length and strength of this connection that in some ways uh, is a good metaphor for the Silk Road. What happens at one end ripples down to the other and has repercussions elsewhere. Roman philosopher Cicero once wrote that disaster cannot happen in Asia without the entire Roman economy being shaken to its foundation. And I felt that there's something of this magnitude uh, simply had to be uh, explored. And the bulk of my own journey was made in 2006. Uh, I had finished university. I wasn't quite sure uh, where I was going to travel, but I got out a big atlas. I looked at uh, all kinds of options, doing east-west Route 66 in the States, uh, north-south pole to pole, looking at countries of Africa. But as my finger came across the middle of this, uh, this atlas, I came across the Stans, and it's a part of the world that I had uh, never heard of, to be honest, by then. It was uh, part of the former Soviet Union, the great bearer of Russia, uh, something which uh, the media had told us we should fear. Um, and then having read books by the likes of Peter Hopkirk or William Dalrymple and Colin Thubron, um, this was not at all the image that they portrayed of this region and of the people. Uh, and it was much more human and um, in many ways melancholic uh, and frankly mad at times. And then China, I read about China, very enigmatic, a real mix of uh, Han Chinese, of Turkic Chinese, of Central Asian, of Persian uh, descendants, absolutely fascinating in the history and all as a result of the Silk Road. And since both regions had only just opened up uh, about 15 years early in the early 90s, uh, for me, that was something that I wanted to go and visit. And so what you get in my books is my personal view of the people I met, if you read uh, Friendly Steps, which is really documenting the travels. Uh, and in this new book, Silk Road Revisited, it's really my personal view of what fascinated me uh, about the, uh, the history. I started my own journey in uh, Venice um, and uh, you know Marco Polo uh, also started his journey in Venice. He probably uh, is still and, and certainly was back then the most famous son of, uh, of Venice. And when he died, he's reported to have said on his deathbed, I have not told half of what I saw. And this, these words were meant to answer accusations that Polo's tales that he wrote in, in a book called The Travels about his adventures in China and Mongolia and India 
were completely fabricated. No one could believe that this part of the world in Central Asia and China existed in the way that he had described with such exoticism. Um, but in fact, they did. And uh, he, he really allowed uh, Europe and, and Venice, which by the time was a very great trading city, to, uh, to understand the splendors that lay beyond their, their immediate borders. And what I like about Venice, and anyone who's been to Venice um, will, will hopefully recognize this. Um, you know, I started in Venice, which is in Italy. It's very familiar to me. It's somewhere that, that I know as a European. Um, but if you look at Venice, Eastern influences have shaped the skyline of Venice. Um, if you walk through the city today, it's hard not to find examples of Eastern design and decor uh, as a reminder of the foundations of which this trading city was built upon. The most striking, perhaps, is the marble facades of the Palazzo Ducale, the Doge's Palace that dominates St. Mark's Square. And if you look at the brickwork patterns on these facades, they're startlingly similar to those seen at the base of something like the Kalon Minaret, which is out in Bukhara in present day Uzbekistan. So you, you see these influences. Once you've seen one, you see them everywhere. And, uh, and so Venice seemed a really natural place for, for me to start. Um, people often ask, you know, as you sat in Venice, uh, and I traveled alone, and they, they often ask whether I was worried on my travels. Uh, and I rather like the way that travel writer Colin Thubron uh, puts, the, uh, puts it. And he said when he traveled, he wasn't worried that something bad would happen, but rather that nothing would happen at all. And, and I think when you travel on your own, uh, it can be very lonely. Uh, and that was probably my biggest fear as I set off uh, along the Silk Road. Uh, it was a fear I needn't have uh, have had because everywhere I met, uh, I, I simply, uh, sorry, everywhere I went, I simply met wonderful people. And so from Venice, I made my way through Eastern Europe, through uh, Serbia and uh, Bulgaria, and ended up in Turkey. Uh, and Turkey, Turkey is the gateway to Asia. It straddles European and Asian continents. Um, and again, I'm sure many people have visited uh, Istanbul, what used to be called Constantinople, and before then Byzantium. Um, and it's a city that probably very few uh, had, any, had seen anything like when they first uh, visited uh, centuries ago. And if you just take a few uh, hours, if you ever visit, to go to the Grand Bazaar today, you still get the, uh, the idea of the Silk Road era. You, you, you get that constant murmur of industrious bartering, the, the sense of uh, exotic spices and invasion of color and pattern that come from the merchant's goods or carpets or tapestries uh, or clothing that they hang out in, in front of their shops. And, and that's really uh, evokes memories of the Silk Road uh, as it was maybe centuries ago. And Istanbul embodies a real meeting of East and West. I mean, again, just take the Hagia Sophia, again, something I'm sure many people may have visited. It was first a Byzantine Christian church and then became an Ottoman mosque. Today, it's actually a secular museum. And uh, that reflects the changing uh, use of, uh, of these uh, monuments uh, as different uh, religions and different empires came in and out of, uh, of the region. And the history of Turkey is uh, quite intricately linked with the Silk Road and, and its empires. It's, uh, you know, it's too big to go into in much detail here. Um, but take someone we all know, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, no stranger to invasions, but in, in 334 BC, he actually invaded uh, Turkey and really to avenge the Persian invasions of, of Greece uh, and landed near Troy and retook a whole number of Greek cities on the Aegean Sea before heading further inland, uh, marching halfway across Turkey. And he ended up at a place called Tarsus, which is just east of the Taurus Mountains. And here he met uh, a very large and strong Persian army under Darius III. Um, he defeated them and then continued, rather than chasing them uh, off, he then continued a two-year expedition, defeating uh, armies in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, before suddenly coming back in 331 BC and spent eight years campaigning in Persia and India and beyond before he actually died in, in Babylon uh, in, uh, in, in modern day Iraq. And so the Greek influence was very uh, well felt throughout Turkey uh, and the Silk Road. He actually went as far as uh, east as the modern city of Kujand in, T in Tajikistan. Uh, and he established his eastern uh, capital in a place called Bactria, or today known as Balkh, 
which is now in northern Afghanistan and, and marks really quite a nice halfway point of the Silk Road uh, and arguably one of its more uh, important cities. And empires came and went, but if you look at the Seljuk Empire, the height of the Seljuk Empire in about the 1090s AD uh, stretched from the Hindu Kush mountains right along the, ma uh, the modern Afghanistan-Pakistan border all the way to the Mediterranean, controlling literally the western half of the Silk Road. And what's interesting is that as a result of this, Turkish became the lingua franca of the Silk Road. And even today, many elements of Turkish language can be understood in the spoken languages as you travel from Istanbul uh, to uh, China. It was very useful in my travels to come into parts of Central Asia and even parts of uh, Western China, where I was able to negotiate in the bazaar because quite often elements of the numbers and the weights and volumes uh, all use the same sort of language. Quite incredible that uh, 2000 years later or 1000 years later from the Seljuk Empire, uh, that language uh, can still help uh, today. And I guess it's no wonder, therefore, that the Crusades set out to uh, this part of the world uh, with the prized cities of, Silk, of the Silk Road really famed for their, their wealth. And my own journey took me across um, uh, Turkey, across the central part of Turkey, uh, towards the Kurdish parts in the east. Again, a very, very different feel from uh, the much more secular uh, parts of uh, the western side of, of Turkey. Um, and I ended up in a very dusty border town called Dobezit, which uh, literally is on the Iranian border. And as I crossed into Iran, uh, the Secretary of State of the US, who was back then Condoleezza Rice, uh, was threatening to bomb the Iranians for their nuclear uh, ambitions. Uh, and I remember getting into the, the, the bazaars in, in the nearby uh, villages and everyone was trading gold. Uh, something that, of course, people go to in times of, of trouble to, uh, to keep the value of, of their, uh, their wealth. And the media at the time, and it still does today, portrayed a world of absolutely mad mullers, long beards, shouting death to America and burning the American flag. So I prepared for the worst. And from the moment I stepped uh, through the border and was detained by a charming uh, security man, the last thing he wanted to do was to uh, look at my passport and uh, search my bags. In fact, he just wanted to spend time and have tea with me and, and then followed invitations to, uh, to eat dinner with him and his family. And anyone who's been can tell you this is not just a, a thing that happens once every so often, and this happened daily to me. And, and it completely changed my view of Iran. And it's really why, for example, I, uh, I want to encourage people uh, to travel. But the history of Iran is probably what has led to so many uh, Iranians being so cultured uh, today because Persia was a land of empires. Um, and if you can see on, on the map still, it was strategically located just south of the Caspian Sea and just above the uh, Persian Gulf. And, and that's why goods literally had to go uh, through Persia if they wanted to reach uh, the West. And empires like the Achaemenids from the fifth century to the third century BC established by names like Cyrus the Great and built magnificent cities uh, like Persepolis, which is just outside of modern day uh, Shiraz, uh, a really a testament to the first great empire of, uh, of, of the, the, the Persians. Um, and then you go a little bit further into the middle of the country, you come across a city called Yazd, a city that I spent a few days in. Uh, and it's a city that's the home to Zoroastrianism. Uh, again, a religion I knew nothing about before I traveled but Zoroastrianism uh, is critical to the foundation of pretty much most modern day religions. Uh, its founder Zarathustra uh, wandered out across the Iranian plateau preaching a new theology about the oneness of God, uh, a chap called Ahura Mazda, the creator. Uh, and he also preached about his opposite force uh, of, of evil, uh, Ahriman, the destroyer. And as the more I read about uh, Zoroastrianism and the more you look at the uh, traditions and, and, and the, um, the sorts of uh, things that uh, Zoroastrians do and believe in, uh, for example, fire and water are a very uh, important part. They're agents of purity in Zoro Zoroastrianism. Um, and, you know, look at Christianity just as one example. Uh, the baptism uses of, of new children uh, uses water. And that's a purifying symbol that uh, very much arose from uh, Zoroastrianism. And I spent four weeks in Iran 
never had a single problem. The, the, uh, the Americans fortunately didn't uh, unleash their army or terror upon us. Um, in fact, the only sign of terror uh, that, or trouble that I had came as I was about to visit uh, the little town of Abiyane, which uh, has a, a Silk Road um, caravanserai uh, ruin. And uh, as I was driving along and my taxi driver, um, we, we were sat behind or driving behind a, a, a lorry which had a lot of heavy metal girders and it turned off the main road into what just looked like an ordinary construction site. And my driver turned to me with a sort of knowing smile and, and winked and said, uh, you know, nuclear energy program. And I said, well, what do you mean? Where's the reactor? I mean, you know, it just looks like a construction site in the middle of the desert and there's absolutely nothing here. Um, and of course, again, he winked with a knowing smile and said, aha, underground. And so, OK, then uh, then that starts to pique my interest. Here we are in the middle of this uh, terrible political tension amongst the nuclear powers uh, and and. And we're just outside a nuclear reactor. And lo and behold, shortly after, we get flagged down by a uh, plainclothes uh, policeman, maybe Secret Service, who knows, uh, who was questioning what on earth a, uh, a, a tourist was doing, or a foreigner, let me say, was doing, uh, driving outside a, a nuclear reactor. Um, unfortunately, language uh, barriers didn't help me, uh, and lots of shouting between the, uh, the taxi driver and uh, this young man. Uh, didn't help uh, ease the tension. So uh, I thought, what's the best thing that you can do uh, to show that you're a tourist is to get out your camera and simulate taking a picture. Uh, this, of course, didn't go down very well. And uh, before I knew it, I had a very angry Iranian policeman with a gun pointing uh, directly at me and even more shouting. Um, so that was the worst trouble that I had. Uh, fortunately, he saw my camera and realized that I was a bedraggled student tourist uh, and let us go on our way with uh, not too much trouble. Uh, but that was really the, the, the only trouble that I got in Iran. And from uh, I Iran, uh, then uh, the Silk Road actually uh, normally heads up north into Turkmenistan. And if you look at the map, you'll, uh, you'll see that uh, my route actually took me through Azerbaijan uh, and across the Caspian Sea, where I hitched a lift with a bunch of uh, Soviet drunken sailors uh, in a cargo ship uh, to make my journey across to, uh, to Turkmenistan. Um, and if, if Turkey was the gateway to Europe, and if Persia was that gatekeeper to Europe, then Central Asia was very much the heart of the Silk Road. And it's a really intriguing mix of rugged, uh, arid grasslands, blistering deserts, particularly in Turkmenistan, uh, and then towering mountains as you go further east to the likes of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. And it's here, I think, that you find some of the greatest Silk Road trading cities. And unlike the other Silk Road cities, it actually offered no alternative routes by sea. So traders had to, uh, or they had no choice, but to face the challenge of the land. And I can tell you at 45 degrees heat, even uh, in a relatively comfortable uh, fan, uh, sort of fanned bus, uh, it was blisteringly hot. And at the time when I went to Turkmenistan, uh, it was under the rule of a chap named Turkmen Bashi, an authoritarian megalomaniac uh, who liked to build gold statues of himself everywhere and uh, build large fountains uh, in the city centers. Uh, interesting to build fountains in a, in a country where you know, it is basically a desert. Um, I mean, he had wonderfully strange ideas and uh, the media have slightly uh, misportrayed them, but I rather like his favorite one was when he decided uh, to ban disease and therefore was able to close the hospitals uh, because no one was uh, was going to get ill. Um, indeed, I believe that today Turkmenistan is one of the only countries that hasn't registered a single case of coronavirus. Um, I was followed. Uh, the hotel room was, uh, was bugged. Um, it's a country which really fears foreigners and uh, has very, very few travelers who, who get there. Um, I had a guide who stuck with me uh, at all times and made sure I didn't uh, stray. Uh, but it's a fascinating country. And again, the few people that I was allowed to interact with, uh, absolutely lovely people. Um, it's a country that's very rich, uh, unfortunately very corrupt, but rich because uh, of the gas uh, and oil reserves that it has. Um, indeed, gas is actually free in Turkmenistan, 
Uh, and if you would go into houses, you would notice that the gas stoves were kept on 24 seven because the match to light the, uh, the gas was more expensive uh, than the gas itself. And even before you uh, realize that here in the heart of Asia, uh, there are no real borders because the Silk Road has created this inter-ethnic mix of people, um, which Stalin in the Soviet era uh, further gerrymandered. Um, and these countries exist, but actually uh, you can hear Persian and people are genuinely Persian in the city of Samarkand, which itself is probably more Tajik than it is Uzbek, much more closer to Persian than, than Turkic, if you like. Um, and then you cross the border from, uh, from Turkmenistan and you come to the legendary cities, the cities of Kiva, of Bukhara, of Samarkand, with their glistening turquoise domes atop their madrasas, these uh, religious schools. And I think if you saw the video, you'll have seen some of these. Um, and it's here that Timur or Tamerlane is idolized. Uh, from the 14th uh, century. He was a pretty bloodthirsty, uh, cruel conqueror uh, that has been taken as Uzbekistan's national hero as it sought to find a, an identity after uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, and I mean, he was particularly cruel. Uh, Samarkand is beautiful. And wherever you go, you will see these glistening domes, this beautiful Majolica tile work. Um, but wherever he took uh, uh, people to build or artisans to build these wonderful um, statues or, or uh, architecture, he would make sure that they could never recreate it again and would gouge their eyes out. So, you know, quite a bloodthirsty guy to have as your national hero. And as you then go further into the heart of uh, Asia, you come to uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. And these are two countries that are very, very different from the Silk Road countries further south and west. And the difference here is that there is much less Persian influence, at least not until much later in their history. Alexander the Great stopped short of really coming to Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan during his march of conquest. And the great wave of Islam uh, took a lot longer to come further north. And the dominant force in this part of the world for a long time had been the nomads. So these were people who have no fixed residence or abode who would wander the land, uh, were quite fearsome warriors, uh, and they controlled uh, the, uh, the, the sort of central or the Eastern Central Asian steppes during large swathes of the Silk Road history. And in the eighth century uh, AD, uh, as Islam was spreading, uh, the Chinese and Arab armies actually met uh, on the border of Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan today at a place called the Talas River. And this is probably the only military uh, contact directly between the Arabs and the Chinese. Uh, and it was a battle that would define whether the history of Central Asia would become Chinese or Islamic. Now, in the end, the Arabs won. And uh, the cultural significance of this battle is now felt throughout uh, Central Asia, which has a much more uh, Islamic and, and Arabic feel. And they took Chinese prisoners of war, uh, including artisans who were experts in paper making and silk weaving and painting and, and metalwork. And, and that's how they then brought that into Central Asia. Genghis Khan also played a massive role in, in particular in this part of the region. Um, I mean, he's always this bloodthirsty uh, warrior. He's betrayed uh, like that. But originally, he had wanted to form an alliance with uh, this part of the, uh, the Silk Road. Um, but when he sent a goodwill caravan in 1218 uh, AD uh, to the region to try and forge relations, uh, they were killed and plundered. Uh, and so his furious response in 1219 uh, was to actually send 200,000 soldiers and conquer the uh, heart of Central Asia. And, you know, Kyrgyzstan is, it, itself, for example, is, is a fascinating country, very, very mountainous. It's split in two for much of the year because uh, the mountain passes are, are not uh, possible uh, by the, uh, the snow. Um, and you get a very different feel if you're in the north in the Soviet part to the south, uh, which has a much more uh, Arabic and, and Islamic feel. Um, Kyrgyzstan for, for me uh, is like the Switzerland of, of Central Asia. It's a place where nature and man uh, live together. Uh, the precipitous mountains are much higher than anything you see in, in Europe. And it's a place where there are literally more horses than cars. Uh, and even today, the semi-nomadic cultures have, uh, has persisted. So you can go out into the uh, mountains and still find uh, semi-nomadic life living in, in felt-covered yurts. 
And, and that's exactly what I ended up doing, was to take a horse for a large chunk of my journey in, in Kyrgyzstan and, and ride the valleys uh, up to uh, visit uh, remote caravanserais like Tashrabat, just near the Chinese border. Uh, and fascinating, you just stop off at these yurts along the way uh, and they're very inviting, want to invite you to, to eat, uh, to drink. Um, and they have a very dubious drink called kumis. If anyone has uh, tried it, you will, you will know why it's dubious. It's actually fermented mare's milk. Um, it's uh, slightly alcoholic uh, and it certainly makes your stomach turn, uh, which is not good when you've got to ride a horse uh, for the next few days. So um, life is very much brought back to basics in, in parts of uh, Kyrgyzstan and, and Kazakhstan. And then finally, I reached China, the land of silk. Um, and for those of you who have read Friendly Steps, um, you'll notice quite a distinct change in my mood when I arrived in China. I mean, I had done 12 countries in just under six months. Uh, I was pretty tired, um, but China itself is enormous. And if you look at the map, and uh, this only got a part of China on it, and I, apologies, you can't see exactly where the, uh, the Chinese boundaries are, but it literally takes up half of the Silk Road. And, and I unfortunately only had six weeks to, uh, to travel through it. But I came from the Western side where you come into Xinjiang, which is a region uh, which is populated by the Uyghurs. And the first thing you notice when you arrive is that they are noticeably Central Asian. So it's again, this border has been put in place, but the people uh, have, have, have just evolved over uh, time and settled there and, and look and, and practice a lot of Central Asian traditions. The difference in China, and, and partly when I was exhausted, I guess this annoyed me initially, was that uh, the, the central government in Beijing was forcibly making sure that a whole uh, bunch of Han Chinese, so if you like your original Chinese, uh, were being uh, forced to move to live in Xinjiang and the people of uh, Xinjiang particularly badly treated by the authorities, despite largely being quite uh, peaceful people. Um, but that's, that's how the modern influence is now changing. And very sadly, uh, Xinjiang, uh, you will, may have seen in the news, has, uh, has had a lot of uh, issues with uh, people being uh, taken off and sent to uh, what can only be described as, uh, well, officially rehabilitation camps, but um, unofficially uh, sound pretty much like prisons. Now, the start of the Chinese Silk Road, of course, uh, has been around also for millennia. Uh, in fact, probably started properly during the first millennium BC and actually long after the first uh, discovery of silk. And the Chinese, you know, what was the reason that they decided to look uh, further west um, was during the Qin and the Han dynasties, the Chinese kept having to fight invaders from the north, this annoying confederacy called the Zhongnu. Uh, in fact, that's partly why they started building walls, which uh, ultimately turned out to be the Great Wall of China. Um, and they desperately needed cavalry to fight uh, the Zhongnu. And so they decided to trade horses with their neighbors, uh, the UAZ Confederacy that were just slightly to the west. And they had heard rumors about even stronger horses. They called them the heavenly horses that were supposed to sweat blood from Central Asia. And so in 140 BC, they sent this young military officer, Zhang Chang, off into Central Asia for a 12 year journey. And after having discovered made alliances and been captured a few times, he came back to tell Emperor Wu uh, he could provide these horses if they traded with this strange uh, Central Asian region. And, and it was these horses that would then uh, help them finally uh, beat off the Zhongnu and, and unify uh, China. When I, when I again came into to, uh, Xinjiang region and uh, the first city you come to is Kashgar, and it's a very Muslim uh, city. It has an open air bazaar that is a reminiscent of the Silk Road many years ago. It has a, an animal market, which is uh, like you are going back hundreds of years. Um, it may not be comfortable seeing, uh, you know, animals traded, animals, you know, traded one minute, slaughtered the next, butchered the next, and then served up to you uh, with a bowl of noodles. Uh, but this is what has been happening for, for centuries at this bazaar. Uh, bizarre, and it's absolutely fascinating for, for me to have seen uh, just how the Silk Road was still being portrayed today. And from Kashgar, then the traveler has the choice of uh, going through two routes, uh, a northern route and a southern route. 
uh, because in the middle, and you can see it to the, the sort of uh, right of the map, lies the Taklamakan Desert, an absolutely ferocious uh, desert uh, that is uh, quite unlike any other deserts. I mean, unlike the Sahara, for example, it's so dry and hot that absolutely nothing grows in it. And the local translation of Taklamakans means go in and you will never come out. So it certainly wasn't something I was prepared to risk. So I actually decided to take the northern route. It's probably a slightly easier route. As I said, I was pretty uh, tired and uh, fed up of traveling by this stage. Uh, and you continue on to cities of Urumqi, of Turfan, and then on to legendary Dunhuang. And uh, again, for anyone who's been to China, Dunhuang is often a key uh, stop. It was a key trading uh, route for the Silk Road, but it was also where Buddhism uh, particularly flourished. And there are some very impressive caves uh, the Thousand Buddha Caves uh, with Buddhist paintings and artifacts, uh, what's left after unfortunately uh, European um, adventurers had plundered them uh, as just a couple of uh, hundred years ago. And from Dunhuang, you go to Jiaguan, which is where the end of the Great Wall uh, traditionally stopped. Uh, for the Chinese, this was the end of the known civilization. If you were to be kicked out of the Chinese uh, country, they would take you to Jiaguan send you out from the fortress and lock the door behind you. And then finally, you come to perhaps the formal terminus of the Silk Road, Xi'an, uh, which is one of the oldest cities. Uh, it served at many times as a capital of, uh, of dynasties uh, and was the eastern terminus of the Silk Road. It was a city that uh, uh, in the eighth century probably had about a million people. And I know by today's standards, that may not sound very impressive, uh, but in those days, that was an enormous uh, city. It was, as it is today, a large, bustling cosmopolitan metropolis. Um, and the, the cultures of China, but also of Eurasia, uh, can also still be seen there today. So you might ask, in what spirit someone undertakes to travel uh, the Silk Road? Um, why I particularly uh, wanted to do it? Um, you know, I think for me, it was about adventure. Uh, a journey uh, that I could really travel where it was the journey that mattered, not the, uh, the destination, uh, where I could try something new and fresh, undiscovered to many people. Um, and I really wanted to test the theory that the media sell to us about this dangerous part of the world that, that people should not go and that uh, is very unfriendly. Um, and most of all, just to meet new people uh, and, and mix with their ideas. You know, for me, of course, travel broadens the mind as well, and that's, that's true. Uh, but for me, what I found from my travels was very much that every time you interact with a new culture, you, you distance yourself just a little bit from what you know, from what has been familiar to you. And, and for me, that allows you to look back both fondly, but also critically at where you've come from uh, and the life that you've known to be normal. Um, and for me, opening myself up to the people, places, cultures, and traditions just added a little bit of perspective uh, and, rich, and, and enrichment. And, and therefore, I hope that both my book, Friendly Steps, and also The Silk Road Revisited, uh, might add just a little bit of that perspective, a little bit of uh, awe about the part of the world that is really rapidly regaining recognition um, as it emerges from its own uh, recent historical turbulence. And of course, in our own times of trouble, as we uh, reflect uh, ourselves, and as I reflect on what The Silk Road taught me, uh, I always look, like to look back at Winston Churchill's quote, uh, that a nation that forgets its past has no future. And the history and the people of the Silk Road, in my mind, has plenty to teach us about our own future. With that, I think I've done enough talking, uh, and uh, I hope uh, you didn't mute me for too much of the, uh, the talk. Um, I guess very happy to open up to uh, questions. Uh, I think some came in the chat, but uh, either on the chat or uh, I don't know, uh, Angelina and Marat, how you like to do it, how people can, whether they have to put up their hands like the old fashioned way to ask a question, but um, happy to take any questions uh, or share your ideas of, uh, of the Silk Road. Nick, I believe we already have some questions uh, um, in chat. Do you want us to read them loud or, yes. or you will check the chat yourself? Uh, that's beyond my technical skills at the moment. Could you read them out? Uh, yes. Um, 
ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม
Um, and the other thing you see with cotton, which again is the modern silk, if you like, um, was that there was a lot of uh, forced labor to actually pick the cotton uh, back then because it was uh, Uzbekistan's main export. Um, so I probably saw more cotton uh, growing uh, than, than mulberry uh, trees, but, but certainly came across a few of them. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you so much for answering. Uh, oh, we have a lot of questions. The next one um, from Sophie. Nick, uh, what was the strangest thing you ate? Best, worst food? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't eat too many uh, strange things that I didn't like unless it was trying to be polite, in which case I didn't want to know what they were. Um, particularly when you're in the yurts, I'm not entirely sure what meat uh, was being cooked up for me. Um, and frankly, I, I didn't want to know. Um, I, I think probably China is the, the bit that sticks in my, uh, my mind most for, for strange foods. I mean, they always say the Chinese will eat anything with its back to the sun. Uh, in my book, that means anything. Um, you know, I had a pretty unpleasant experience eating donkey meat uh, in, in China. Um, I, I was actually refused fortunately, but refused uh, dog meat, which is obviously something that um, uh, the Chinese uh, do treat as a delicacy. Um, and th there's a story that I have in, in at the back of uh, Friendly Steps, which details an incident uh, eating, uh, eating duck. Um, again, my brother and I were, were at a restaurant and we ordered Peking duck. And for those of us, uh, certainly in the UK, um, you have a Chinese and you order Peking duck, you have a lovely... Um, uh, pancakes and you put spring, uh, spring onions and you put some sauce on and you, you get the lovely duck and we ordered duck and lo and behold it came looking exactly like we would have at home so having had all these strange foods with strange bits of offal in them and what's so on and so forth um, we were thrilled to suddenly find a bit of food that we recognized this huge pile of um, of duck and we started eating and this was delicious and they kept bringing us more pancakes and, you know, we got further down, there was a bit more bone, and then there was bits of uh, feet. And we got down to the bottom, we were pretty full by this stage, and looking out at us was the glazed head of the duck. And by this stage, we said we really had enough, and I think the uh, poor restaurant owner was quite offended, because I think that was supposed to be the, um, uh, the best bit. And I don't want to think how you uh, ate that. But uh, yeah, certainly some strange foods, but fun, fun and games. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is comes from from Henry. He asks, Nick, I think you you travel on your Swiss passport. How different do you think your experience would have been if you had traveled on your British one? <laughs> uh, yes. So for those who don't know, I, I have the the great fortune of being half Swiss and half uh, British. Um, I, it was a conscious decision actually to travel on my Swiss passport because it's. Um, a, the visas were cheaper. Uh, B, most of the countries that I was traveling in uh, quite like the Swiss because the dictators of these countries tended to keep their money there. So, uh, so hence why they were quite willing to let me in. Um, and, uh, you know, it felt like a less controversial uh, passport. I mean, frankly, it's a passport, right? I mean, it doesn't do anything for you except at the border and getting visas. So, um, uh, I didn't fortunately need any consular help. So, I don't know how that would have uh, played out. Um, but uh, it was very useful to have my Swiss passport, which has all of my stamps from the strange and wonderful countries. And then my British passport is a very clean passport for when I need to go to countries that may not appreciate, um, you know, some of these parts of the world. I mean, I certainly know if you want to go to the States, for example, um, they're very keen if you've got stamps from places like, uh, you know, uh, Iran or uh, uh, some of the stands uh, to, to take you for questioning. So that's been very helpful. Okay, and also Lara is wondering why you are interested in Silk Road. Well, I hope my talk uh, gave you some of the uh, the uh, the rationale, but uh, for me, it's just again to reiterate, it's a part of the world that very few people go to, and it's uh, a part of the world with a fascinating history that, that we're not taught at school, and yet it's a, a history that for me has left an indelible mark on on our civilization in in Europe, and and therefore it's something I absolutely had to. Uh, to, to follow and visit and, and, and meet these people who I was told by the media were all, you know, terrible people who, uh, who wanted to rob me and, uh, and, and, and murder me. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, well, I have to scroll a lot. From Julia, she asks, which of your experience was the most eye-opening? Um, well, I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, many, many experiences, of course, opened my eyes, and that's really what I reflect most on. Um, I, I think for me, uh, you know, I reflect on some of the kindest people that I met on the Silk Road were often the people who had the least in terms of material wealth. And, um, you know, it's very easy in, in, in our busy lives. We're all working and we're all, you know, buying and the, accumulating material things. But, um, you know, what, what struck me the most, and Iran is probably the best uh, country, you know, people gave their time willingly. I appreciate I was probably a curiosity to some extent, but they gave their time willingly. They invited me for dinners uh, that, you know, it was an extra mouth to feed. Uh, where they may not have been able to afford it on a normal uh, basis, but they, you know, in, in the light of sort of Iranian tradition, were very keen to, to invite me and to be part of their life. Um, and, you know, I mean, in Iran, I would stop, ask for directions, not only would the person, you know, get on the bus with me and take me to where I was going, but I typically find that I was invited to a dinner that evening, maybe even their cousin's wedding the next, uh, you know, next month or something, which of course I wouldn't have been able to attend. Um, and, you know, I always think of the, the Iranian tourist who comes to London, as an example, uh, you know, you're lucky in London if someone gives you directions, uh, and that's about it. So, you know, it's people giving you much more than, than they can afford or that they have materially that, uh, that probably struck me the most. Thanks, that is lovely. Um, the next question is from Ruth. She's asking, can a single woman can a single woman travel alone in, in, in Eastern Asia? What is your advice? Yeah, I mean, obviously I, I had the perspective uh, from, from uh, being a man. So uh, my perspective uh, is obviously a, l a little bit fortunate in the sense that, um, you know, I think I felt a lot safer, number one. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that uh, in, in some countries, you know, one might feel less safe if, if you're a woman. I mean, I think the thing that most interested me was that when I was in Iran, and um, in Iran, as you probably know, uh, under Islamic law, the women have to cover their, their heads, uh, and some women actually cover more, and they cover their faces as well. Uh, but the law says everybody, so even foreigners have to at least wear a headscarf. And uh, I remember being infuriated by this at the first, that I thought this was disgraceful, and how could they treat uh, women like this? Um, and actually, then I, I was talking to some fellow uh, female travelers who were uh, traveling on their own. And I said, well, what do you think about this? And they said, well, you know, it's quite interesting because, um, you know, we feel very, very safe here because we can almost go under a, a cloak of anonymity. And it's a country, Iran, that actually does respect women. Um, you may not see it so much in the public life, but it's certainly in the private life. And in fact, the women rule the house uh, in, in, in sort of private life. Um, and so they were saying, actually, they felt a lot uh, safer um, being able to be a little bit more anonymous. And so I would then talk to, occasionally to Iranian um, women. I mean, again, that was a difficult dynamic because uh, they were quite nervous talking to uh, a foreigner. Um, and, and that was not something that came uh, naturally. Um, and I said to the Iranian women, you know, what do you um, uh, think about this? And, and, you know, and they said, well, underneath all of this, we still wear the makeup and the jewelry. Um, but again, you know, it allows us to go around our life feeling completely safe and anonymous. And, you know, they couldn't understand why uh, our girls in Newcastle, I'm picking Newcastle, but uh, generally they were like, why do they go out dressed, you know, in very tight tops with nothing on? And then they wonder why they get uh, wolf whistled at, at best and... Uh, well, you know, uh, raped or, or whatever at worst. I mean, that's how they looked at it and they couldn't understand how we dressed. So it's quite a different perspective. Um, as I say, personally, I felt very lucky because I felt a lot easier to be safer. Um, certainly when you're going into someone's home that you don't know. Um, but, but, you know, there are elements in, in some of these countries that I think it might even be safer to be a woman. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, from Zoom user. Uh, considering the region's multiple cultural influences over time, where do you see the re region 
of giants solved in the near future. So where do I see the region what, sorry? Uh, Algin, Alginin. Aligning. Oh, Al sorry, aligning. Ah, sorry. So could you just repeat yeah, the question? Sorry. Where do I see the region aligning, aligning in the future? It's from your brother. But where do you see it aligning in the future? Oh, you, you can't even spell, that's good. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> late. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, um, so yeah, no, I think the region, um, it, it's, it's an interesting one. You know, if you go to Central Asia, then, um, you know, you get quite an interesting set of influences happening. So you have uh, Russia from the north, you have China from the, uh, the east, you have the US effectively and Europe from, uh, from the west. Um, and, and they're all vying for influence. And, um, you know, this was first, the idea of this was called the great game in the 19th century, where um, uh, you had imperial uh, Russia and you had uh, the British Empire sort of vying for influence in the region. And, um, you know, I think if you now go and look at this new geopolitical um, sort of angle, then uh, what you actually uh, see now is, uh, go to different countries. When I was there, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, we had um, uh, the Americans had a base in, in the Manas airport, the main airport. And that was uh, the base that they used for their raids into Afghanistan. And they were paying a large amount of money to um, the, uh, the Kyrgyz to have this base. And then a few years later, that base no longer goes to the Americans, it goes to the Russians, who then um, uh, you know, were paying to have uh, their, their army or their uh, military there. So, um, you know, I think the region has a bit of a choice uh, and it's strategically located, but of course, as I said, it's not actually got any access to seaports. Uh, it's a landlocked region. And so that means it has to play quite a careful game of diplomacy um, between the Russians who are still big uh, influence in the region. There's still a lot of Russians living in, in Central Asia. Um, and, uh, and and sort of uh, sort of the West, as it were, um, and that's just Central Asia. And obviously, you've got China, which is its own uh, you know it's a topic in itself. Um, so, where do I see it aligning? Uh, it's difficult to know, but I suspect it will still try and play that delicate role between uh, Russia and, um, uh, and 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 the and the European side. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, Sorry, just to jump in there. Do you think China isn't that, that influential or, or... Big pardon? Big pardon? Are you saying that China isn't that influential in the region then? Or between Russia and the, and the West or...? No, I mean, China, China, I think, is just a very, very different um, uh, sort of beast, if you like. I mean, China's got a much more global uh, agenda, as you, as you know. But it, it's been very influential in the region. I mean, what you would find, I mean, um, when we were driving along the Pamir Highway in Tajikistan, um, the, the people who were building and mending the roads are Chinese. And the Chinese were actually sending workers to, um, to Tajikistan to build the roads. Why? Well, A, to give uh, people employment in China. Uh, B, because they're actually building the roads quite often for no cost. But it's effectively to gain influence in in the relations with those those countries, and you've seen that all around the world as well. It's not just Central Asia, um, but I mean, China is 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 a much more global uh, sort of discussion, I guess, than, than Central Asia, which which is the heart of the Silk Road that that I think has a more interesting geopolitical geopolit um, stance. Okay, thank you. Can I move to the next question? Yes, sure. I, I don't know how we're doing on time, but. Um, well, we have kind of six questions left. Okay, let's try and try and get through those. I mean, uh, yeah, the next is from Simon Lord. He's um, he's saying, Nick, thanks for the interesting presentation. Obviously, the Silk Roads region has changed enormously over the last thirty years and continues to change. Do you have any impressions about how the region will develop over the next few years and ever beyond? I appreciate this is a big question, but I'm sure people would find it insight to be of interest. Yeah, I mean, I guess it follows on from, from the last question. Uh, it's, it's a massive topic. I mean, I, I think what's clear is um, that these countries uh, are, that are along the Silk Road, you know, 
when the Soviet Union came, they sort of went out of um, uh, out of view for for a while. Um, but actually, they're now regaining uh, quite a lot of prominence because trade is uh, opening up in the regions. Um, as I said, post independence, a lot of these regions are now transitioning. I mean, Kyrgyzstan, uh, for example, is now a democracy. Um, and that's opening up new avenues. Uh, yes, there are still authoritarian rulers in other uh, regions, but even those, I mean, look at Kazakhstan is quite a, a benign uh, regime in many ways. Um, and so they're looking for how to build links and credible links uh, with trading partners, both East, East and, and West. So, um, you know, I think you've, you ignore uh, Central Asia, for example, at your peril. Um, and I think that the, you know, you've, you've already seen the Chinese have made a big thing called the One Belt and Road uh, Project and it's come through various iterations since, um, where they are really trying to reopen those connections from, uh, you know, thousands of years ago along the Silk Road. So my, my view is that it's still as strategic and geopolitically important as before. Um, of course, oil and gas play a big uh, part in, in that and uh, pipelines uh, as well as they connect through to different countries. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you ignore it at your peril. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question from Diana, she's asking, are the people of the Northern I Central Asia countries worried about a reintroduction of Russian influence? But other people of? Uh, once again. Uh, are the people of the northern Central Asian countries worried about the reintroduction of yeah. Russian influence? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess you have to ask ask them themselves, but um, uh, and, and maybe one or two on the call. But um, uh, you, you know, I think the 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 Russian influence has always been there. It's it's obviously a very recent uh, influence, and I think that um, you know. On, on the one hand, if you go to uh, the, um, uh, the, the sort of Central Asian region, um, you know, each country wants to become uh, its own independent state and, and be fully independent from, from Russia, but also from, from China. But unfortunately, because you've got a lot of these historical ties um, and a lot of the way that the systems were set up were very much Russian and Soviet, um, you know, I, I think there is still a natural tie to Russia. Um, I mean, I, I spent five years living in Russia, so I'm a big Russia file. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think it's, again, as bad as, uh, as, as all that that people portray. Um, but clearly what you want to avoid is, uh, you know, any power, um, if you like, trying to stamp its authority. Um, and, you know, the Russians have in the past, uh, not in Central Asia, but as you know, around Ukraine and, and Georgia, uh, been accused of, uh, of trying to uh, invade or, or sort of influence their power. Uh, there. Um, I don't think that the Russians will ever let go of the region spiritually, if you like. I mean, I think they still feel it's part of uh, part of Russia. Um, I mean, if you look at the 19th century during the times of the Great Game, you know, unfortunately, Central Asia was this buffer zone between the British Empire uh, in India and the, uh, the Russian Empire. Uh, and to be honest, it may well still have to play that role. And that's why I said it, it probably needs a diplomatic role to play um, to keep you know, all of these people at bay. Um, so I think there will be influence, but I think uh, as it develops and as uh, these countries become more credible, um, then I think you'll find that it relies less and less on Russia. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, one of the latest question is, what are the major issues in common facing Central Asia countries? The question is from Raza, I hope that is correct spell of her name. Yeah, well, <laughs> again, it's probably another topic that I think you could um, have have, a, have your own uh, Zoom call on separately. But um, no, I, I mean, I think the, the, the key thing that I, I felt when I traveled was, um, you know, Cent Central Asia for a long time after independence was trying to find uh, its identity, trying to find its way in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think there are a number of, of issues. Some of these are actually quite historical. I mean, I was talking about um, the, 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 the way that the Silk Road had mixed a whole bunch of ethnicities 
um, you know, that's still a big issue. I mean, the borders, as I said, have been uh, were basically drawn by Stalin, but you've got Tajiks in Uzbekistan or uh, Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential tension that, that can arise uh, from that. So I think that's still a, an issue that, that needs to be addressed. Um, the other one that I'm always interested in is water. Um, I mean, it may sound a strange thing, but um, in the days of the Soviet Union, you know, Central Asia, for example, um, you had the, uh, the rather desert countries that had lots of oil and gas and could uh, provide uh, the, the, the power and so forth for the, um, uh, the, the factories and, 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 and generate uh, cheap petrol for cars to be spread across the, across the Soviet Union. And then you had the water coming from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the mountainous regions, you know, coming down and, and they would uh, feed the, uh, the fields downstream. So not just in their country, but also in, in other countries further downstream. And of course, now that you're all independent, the, the real issue you've got is um, if you're in, in Tajikistan, you don't have oil and gas. So you want to make uh, yourself secure from an energy perspective. What do you do? You go and build a dam and you generate hydropower. And that sounds great. You're being environmentally friendly. The problem is the people downstream who have the oil and gas, but don't have the water, now don't have the water to, uh, to feed their crops. And, and so I think, you know, that's another issue that always uh, concerns me, um, that, that I think is, is something that still to be addressed, uh, you know, really through a cooperation in the region. Um, and, um, you know, may, maybe, uh, maybe those are the two main ones that I just stopped there because I think you can keep going, but uh, I, I think you're probably running out of time. Yeah, a uh, couple of questions. Uh, Seraf Serafima is asking, um, I would like to know where the best noodles were and if there was a language you felt would have been good to know that everyone could understand besides English. Yeah, so uh, yeah, noodles, uh, the story of noodles always amuses me because, um, you know, the, the the myth, and I think it is probably a myth, but uh, if you ask the Italians, they'd say it's a myth. The myths, myth goes that Marco Polo tasted noodles in, uh, in China and then brought them all the way along the Silk Road and uh, lo and behold, pasta became the uh, Italian dish. Um, it's probably not quite uh, as true as that, but um, no, I, I mean, my favorite dish, as uh, anyone who knows me uh, uh, and who's been to Central Asia with me, is lagman, which is a Central Asian dish of noodles. And um, uh, that is, those are where I had the best noodles. So it wasn't in China. And sorry, what was yeah. the other question? About what was the language that was useful? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess Turkish was useful for countries where I didn't know the language because there was always elements of Turkish. Uh, and unfortunately, Russian uh, was, was most useful because, uh, you know, most people over a certain age were educated in Russia under the Soviet Union. So, uh, so that was very helpful. Okay, thank you. Actually, Lagman is my favorite dish also. <laughs> and Peter, uh, yeah, the question from Peter Lindsay, uh, he's asking how is it to withdraw cash from cash machines in the various Central Asia states? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I think it's better now, but I remember going to Turkmenistan and um, I had a hundred dollar bill and I said to the guide, I said, could you take me to, uh, no, there was no cash machines there. So could you take me to the bank? No, no, the bank will give you the official rate. The official rate is 5,000 manat to the pound. And I said, well, what, how else can I get, you know, like money changes? I'll take you to the market. You can get the unofficial rate. It's 25,000 manat to the pound. Um, so I said, okay, fine, we'll go to the market. And uh, I proudly give my crisp hundred dollar bill over. And um, the guy uh, looks at me and says, have you got a carrier bag? And I said, no. He said, well, I'll sell you a carrier bag, you know, for, for a dollar. So, okay, I bought that for a dollar. And lo and behold, he then puts a million manat in very small denomination notes wrapped in rubber bands into my plastic bag. And there I go carrying off my plastic bag for the, uh, the rest of the day with a million manat, which is basically a hundred dollars. Um, so uh, cash machines, not always available. Okay, thank you. So we, I guess we're done with the questions it's because I don't see any uh, new one. And I have one, and I have one question from, from my side, which is what will be your first country to visit after COVID-19? <laughs> is my wife still on the call? <laughs> Um, 
That's a very, very good question. Sadly, it's probably not uh, anywhere on, on the Silk Road. Um, uh, I guess probably the, 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 the one I'd like to go to most is probably just to Switzerland to see uh, family and, uh, and friends and to go skiing, but uh, we, we, will, we will see. Okay, thank you. So I think we're done with a uh, question um, section. So thank you. Yeah, just to say thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining. And um, I hope we can continue the conversation in person uh, when we can meet again. Thank you. Good night. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Everyone, there will be more book launches uh, later in uh, November and December. We will send you invitations. Uh, please uh, join us. And for all participants of this book launch, we're happy to provide free shipping of the book in UK and also 15% discount if you order two or more books. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye.